1972, my life was uh, broken. I was uh, a drug addict. I was uh, a criminal. My family was broken. My wife had filed for divorce a couple of times. My children were afraid of me. I really couldn't hold a job. My mental state was terrible. And it was in that uh, frame of life that I took my six-year-old son one night and went down to a little market going inside to purchase some things. And on the way in to that market, I met a gentleman coming out the door and an argument erupted. And uh, before I knew it, I had just hit him, knocked him down, and he fell into a, a stack of bottles. The bottles bursted, and uh, immediately he leaped up with a broken bottle and began to stab at me. I lifted my left arm to try to stop the, the blow, and the bottle actually severed the biceps muscle, the uh, major arteries in my arm, and I was bleeding to death in a, just a matter of seconds. But full of anger and hatred and rage, I kept fighting and kept bleeding. My little son was screaming. He was hysterical. But the man that ran the store came over and said, if, if you don't get to a hospital, you'll bleed to death in just a few minutes. So he actually took me in my own automobile to the hospital. And when we entered the emergency room, I was barely conscious. And as the uh, medical attendants began to work on me, I could hear their voices. And I could hear them saying, we can't help him. He'll have to be transported to another hospital. Probably will lose the arm. And as they loaded me into an ambulance, my wife had arrived by that time and got in the ambulance with me. But as they pulled out of the parking lot of that hospital, a young paramedic looked down into my face and I could barely see him. I was so weak. But he said, Sir, you need Jesus Christ. And I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know what he was talking about. So my reaction to that was to begin cursing. And uh, again, he stated to me, You need Jesus. And as he was talking to me, it it appeared like the ambulance literally exploded in flames. I, I thought it had actually blown up. It filled with smoke. And immediately I was moving through that smoke as if through a tunnel. And after some period of time coming out of the smoke and out of the darkness, I began to hear the voices of a multitude of people screaming and groaning and crying. But as I looked down, the sensation was looking down upon a, a, a volcanic opening and seeing fire and smoke and, and people inside of this burning place screaming and crying. They were burning, but they weren't burning up. They weren't being consumed. And then the sensation of moving downward into this. But, but the most terrible part of it, I began to recognize many of the people that I was seeing in these flames. As if a close-up lens on a camera was bringing their faces close to me, I could, I could see their features and see the agony and the pain and the frustration. And a number of them began to call my name and said, Ronnie, don't come to this place. There's no way out. There's no escape. If you come here, there's no way out. And I looked into the faces of, of one that had died in a robbery attempt, who had been shot to death and bled to death on the sidewalk. And I looked in the face of two others that had died drunk in an automobile accident. And I looked into the face of others that had died of drug overdoses that we had partied together. and and the agony and the pain, but I believe the most painful part of it was the loneliness. And the depression was so heavy 
that there was no hope, there was no escape, there was no way out of this place. And the smell was like a sulfur, like an electric welder. And the, the stench was, was terrible. And as I looked at this, I had seen people killed. I had been involved in fights where people were killed. I'd done time in prison for manslaughter myself. I grew up basically in a reform school and in a jail cell. I was beat on mercifully as a child by a father that had temper problems and alcohol problems. I was a runaway at 12 years old and I felt like there was nothing in this world that could frighten me. My life was wrecked, my marriage was wrecked, my health was wrecked, but now I'm seeing something that literally scares me to death because I don't understand it. And as I'm looking into this, this pit, this place of fire and screams and, and torment, I just fade out into blackness. And when I open my eyes, I'm in a hospital room in Knoxville, Tennessee. My wife is sitting by. There have been uh, multiple stitches put in my body. My arm was spared. Uh, there was almost a hundred stitches. And I, I looked in the face of my wife. And I wasn't concerned about where I was or anything around me. All I could visualize was what I had just seen. He had this funny look on his face. And it was a terrifying look. And he said, he said, I don't really know what's happened to me, but he said, I've been in a terrible place. And I kept telling him, you're in the hospital. You've, you've been in the hospital all along. And he kept saying, no. He said, I've been in another place. He said, he said I don't know exactly what it was, but he said it was terrible. It was a terrible place. I could still hear the screams. I could still smell the terrible smell. I could still feel the heat. And I could still hear the voices of people that I'd known through the years screaming for me to go back. And through the days to come, I tried every way to get that out of my mind. I tried to get drunk. I could not get drunk. I tried to get stoned. I could not get stoned. I tried everything that I could to get this off my mind, and I could not. One morning, several months later, I, I came home to where my wife was. I'd been trying to get drunk. I couldn't. And when I walked in the house, went back to the bedroom, the light was burning. My wife was sitting up in bed. And she had a large book open on her lap. And she looked up at me and her face was literally shining. And she said, Ronnie, tonight I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And she didn't have to say a lot to me. Our life had been filled with, with agony. She grew up in Chicago. Her father was a bartender on the south side of Chicago. She knew nothing about God or church or religion. And the pain in her face, the wrinkles that I'd put in her face with abuse and violence and alcoholism and drug addiction, being gone for months at a time and her and the kids not knowing where I was, her face had changed. The wrinkles were literally gone. The smile had replaced the sorrow and agony. And she looked at me and she said, Jesus, save me tonight. And she said, would you go with me and hear about this man called Jesus? And I thought for a second and I thought, I've tried everything else in life. Nothing has worked for me. The people that I love most of all, my wife and my children, I'm, I'm terrible to them. And I agreed to go with her. And a couple of weeks later on a Sunday morning, a matter of fact, the date was November the 2nd, 1972. Just before 12 o'clock a.m., a minister stood to, to read from the Bible. I was sitting in the back of the building. I didn't know 
anything out of the Bible. I did not know how to act in church. But the minister stood to read from the Bible. And he read from the Gospel of John. And he began to read these words that said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When he said the Lamb, he had my attention. It wouldn't have meant anything to me, any other passage. But when he mentioned the Lamb, he had this hard-hearted sinner's attention. Because when I was nine years old, a very poor child in the mountains of eastern Tennessee, with a father that only knew anger and, and abuse and alcohol, a neighbor had given me a baby lamb. It was my friend, the only friend I felt like I had. And it was uh, such a friend in days and weeks to come, it, it followed me and it would, it would meet me when I got off the school bus and came walking through the woods and the fields. One evening as I came in, the lamb was missing. And in a drunken fit of anger, and my father had plunged the tire iron through that lamb's body. And when I saw my lamb, my friend, dead, I began to scream as a nine-year-old child. And from that point, I was never, never, ever the same. By 12 years old, I was a runaway. I was in the juvenile system, arrested time after time after time. There was no respect for authority. I hated anyone that represented authority over me. And by the time I was 15 years old, I had been in jail for car theft, for stealing. And at 15 years old, I was sentenced for manslaughter, involved in a car accident that had taken life and crippled others for life wondering at that time if life ever would hold anything for me. But when that minister mentioned the Lamb, he had my attention. And he said, Jesus Christ is God's Lamb. And he died and he shed his blood that whosoever will could have a new start, could be forgiven, could start over. That morning, as I stood to try to leave the building, I thought, I don't want anybody to see me cry. I've not cried since I was nine years old. I'm not afraid of any living thing on this earth, and no one's going to see me cry. But I turned to leave, but I started down the aisle toward the front of that building. And my prayer was this. I didn't know the sinner's prayer. I didn't know the Roman road of salvation. But my prayer was this, God, if you exist, and Jesus, if you are God's lamb, please, please kill me or cure me. I don't want to live anymore. I'm not a husband. I'm not a father. I'm no good. And at that instant, it was like the darkness and the blackness left my life and the tears began to flow. And for the first time since I was nine years old, the tears did run and the guilt left my life and the violence and the anger and the hatred left my life and Jesus Christ became Lord and Savior of my life that morning. And since that time, I didn't know what would happen, but God healed my mind, my memory. The drug addiction, the alcoholism was instantaneously gone, delivered. And from that moment, I knew that I had to tell the story of what had happened to me. My life was only spared to tell others about the place that I had seen and the hope of Jesus Christ to save mankind from this terrible fate.